So we're going to call the meeting to order at 6.15 p.m. Welcome, everybody, to our Washington Central Unified Union School Board meeting. Uh, thank you for making the time to be here with us. We have, like I said, a few board members that are online at this point. I believe it's just Julia and Kelly, right? Could you guys give me the thumbs up if that's correct? Just Kelly. Just Kelly. Okay. I'm online. Hi, Kelly. Welcome. And then you have the rest of the board members are, are here with us. And Natasha is going to be joining us a little later. And Diane had a personal <coughs> thing, and she won't be joining us tonight. Okay. Any adjustments to the agenda? I just wanted to welcome everybody. We are going to have time for public for public comments, both online and 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 here. I'm going to wait to talk about configuration and that part of the welcome until we are in that in that part of the agenda. I didn't want to take too much time this evening to get us started in the hopes that we can get you all out really early. So welcome everybody, and let's move into community <coughs> input. So, any public comments? I don't see any hands up. So, we're going to move into our first part of the meeting, which is the uh, Title I presentation. I want to welcome Jen to give the annual presentation, and Stephen is going to share his screen. His screen, or you want me to okay. oh, give, give him a second. Oh, there you are, Julia. You're back. Okay. See. All right, so Stephen's going to share the screen. Is this good? Can you all hear me? Okay. Awesome. Okay. <clears throat> so in addition to being the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, I am the Consolidated Federal Programs Grant Manager for our district. And one of our requirements is that we have an annual Title I meeting. The meeting is something that's supposed to happen separate from other events. Years ago, we actually would try to combine it with open houses, and that really doesn't meet the, the assurance for the state. Last year, um, I followed the lead of one of my colleagues in another district and held a virtual meeting for Title I, and zero people attended. And so this year, we're going to try to do the annual Title I uh, meeting as part of the board meeting, also in part because there's some budgetary impacts that you all need to be aware of um, re regarding sources of revenue. So Stephen, next slide, please. So um, if there were more of us from the public who didn't know each other, we would be doing introductions. We're going to skip introductions. Uh, obviously, this is being recorded, and I will work to get the, the section of the annual Title I meeting online so that others who aren't here tonight who want to see it can. But we're going to go through primarily Title I, how we use Title I, what they are, how we use them, what the requirements are, We'll touch briefly on Titles 2 and 4, which are part of Consolidated Federal Programs, and then I will welcome your questions and any feedback. Next slide. So we're going to talk about how our schools participate, what the requirements are for Title I, and the parental rights for Title I. Next slide. So Title I is a federal source of funds, and, um, and the, the purpose of those funds is to make sure that all students um, have a, an opportunity, a fair, equitable, and high, uh, to receive a fair, equitable, and high-quality education, and to close uh, achievement gaps. We talk about differences in performance among subgroups. And so we, meet, we receive funds, our Title I eligible schools, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, um, to support uh, academically struggling students. And those services are intended to provide additional or supplemental supports, not to supplant um, or provide sur supports that were already required by state statute to provide. Next slide. So, um, the way that the funds are generated is um, through a measure of poverty. We use the free and reduced lunch rate, or FRL rate, to determine Title I eligibility. 
Schools that have a higher percentage of students coming from low-income families receive more Title I funds per pupil. And this year, the schools that are served are Berlin and Doty. Our FRL, or free and reduced lunch rates, have varied over the years. So some, uh, for a while, some of you who are, were on um, the Callis board for many years before we um, merged for, through Act 46 would re remember that uh, Callis was eligible for Title I in the past. U32 has been eligible. Um, and sometimes schools are eligible, but we don't serve them with Title I funds because we have local funds that we can use to serve them or other sources of funds. We operate school-wide programs. That means that regardless of poverty level or not, we can um, serve any student in a school that is a Title I eligible school. Next slide. So again, Title I funds are allocated on a per pupil basis. And, um, and you have to make sure that the school with the highest percentage of low income students um, has the highest per pupil amount, regardless of the number of students who have been served. For us, that means that um, for Doty and Berlin, Doty has a higher percentage this year for FRL eligibility. It's 57%, but that's 36 students. So there are fewer students living in poverty in, in Worcester than there are in Berlin, um, just because of straight up student population. So Berlin's low income percentage that we're working with for FY25 is 49%. That's 78 students. For me, mathematically, it means I need to work really closely with Suzanne to make the formula work to get what we need in order to support our students um, when we have discrepancies in data like that. And just so you are also aware, the numbers in our other schools are um, 41 students at Romney, uh, 281 at U32, 21 in Callis this year, and 59 at East Montpelier. Next slide. So I mentioned that we operate school-wide programs, which means that we can serve any of the students, K through six at Berlin, who need supports. Our Title I allocation at Berlin was um, about $254,000. Once I plugged in the formula and figured it all out, we are using that money to support the following positions that are listed on that slide. So we completely fund one literacy interventionist with our school-wide program money, um, and then 0.6 of our literacy and math teacher leaders who provide interventions as well. It's important to know that um, that costs more than $254,000, and so um, to fund everything that we need. I also need to combine sources of federal grant funds. So I use a little bit of Title II money, about $31,000, and a little bit of Title IV money to create this school-wide program source. And the other point four of each of those bottom two positions, we fund locally. So it's important for you to understand that. Next slide. So Doty also operates a school-wide program. Sorry. That's okay. Um, and I'll keep talking while Stephen pulls it back up. Uh, Doty's Title I allocation is $117,000 approximately. And we fund 0.5 of a math teacher leader and 0.5 of a literacy teacher leader with that money. Um, it, th those investments cost us about $118,000. So I take, um, I take a few hundred dollars from Title II and Title IV to fund what is needed at Doty. Next slide, Stephen. There are also all sorts of other requirements for Title I expenditures, and so this name is horrible, neglected and delinquent, but that is the name of, of the program in the federal legislation. Um, we operate some micro-residentials in Berlin, or, or they exist in the towns, uh, town of Berlin, and we're required to support them so that the students who are residing there have access to some services. So I meet with the representatives from uh, Washington County Mental Health to figure that out. 
We also are required to provide equitable services to any independent school that is in our geographic catchment area. For us, that's Orchard Valley Waldorf School, and they are um, entitled to participate in titles one, two, and four. You'll see that they do choose to do that, and, um, and that is completely a formulaic approach, the allocation that I must um, allocate to them. And then I meet with the representatives at Orchard Valley Waldorf School a number of times during the year to support. And that is um, for Title I. They are doing some math tutoring for um, students in need who reside in our towns and are eligible. In that case, it's not school-wide programs. It's targeted assistance, which means they have to be eligible both financially and academically. And then we are required to serve, um, to set aside Title I money to support students who are experiencing homelessness. I operate this part of our supports, and Julie is our homeless liaison. Um, to, we have, our, most of our needs over the years are transportation. And in past years, bless you, we've had a, a different uh, grant to support transportation. We applied for and did not get that grant this year. And so when the carry forward comes through and I amend my grant this year, any carry forward I have for Title I, I am gonna have to invest, um, I'm guessing, twelve to $13,000 to support our transportation needs for our families of kids who are experiencing homelessness. That sounds right to you, yeah. Okay, next. So there are a number of requirements for Title I that we have to meet and, um, and a number of parental rights. So we have to communicate to parents and families. We do our annual school reports to, um, to satisfy that requirement. We have to provide assessment information about um, parents' rights to opt out where applicable. There is no formal opt out for assessments and we're required to have students uh, participate because we are recipients of federal funds. Uh, funds. We have to provide achievement results. We have to let um, families know when their teachers might be um, not properly licensed and we have to let them know that they have the right to request information about their teacher's qualifications. Next slide. We also have to engage in some um, family and parent engagement activities. We are required to have a family school compact and, um, and we have a, you all have a policy about having a parent school compact. It's policy E1. Um, we don't receive uh, enough Title I money to kick in other requirements around certain set-asides. If you receive a half a million dollars or more of Title I funds, there are more per, uh, family engagement requirements. We don't meet that threshold. We also have to engage in um, consulting, which is why I think timing this meeting along with the budget process makes sense because um, we, it's all part of the package, what we're offering for our students programmatically. Some of it is um, with local funds and some of it is with grant funds. Next slide. Um, we have to let families know publicly, which I'm doing right now, that we can uh, con combine sources of, of funds to run a school-wide program. We do that because then we have the flexibility to serve any of our students in need, regardless of their income levels. Um, we work together to coordinate various student services. All of our paraeducators need to be highly qualified. There are a number of pathways for highly qualified paras, and we work to ensure that they are indeed highly qualified. And um, we have to make sure that we're maintaining access for students who are migratory and or experiencing homelessness uh, and offer high quality effective curricula. This is a list of other requirements. We have to make sure we have um, our professional learning needs we've identified through a needs assessment. We can do that easily through um, some of what pops up for vector solutions and some of what is popping up related to state legislation, for example, Act 173. Act 139, the literacy bill. 
Um, we have to also do things, some of this is not quite as relevant for, for this conversation tonight, but um, for example, safe and drug-free schools, we have to let our employees know um, that we operate safe and drug-free schools and we have to let them know what, um, what the ramifications are. And we do that through um, one of our modules for mandatory annual training, for example. There are some fiscal responsibilities and tests that we have to meet every year. Uh, for example, we have to um, meet a comparability test to show the state that, um, that we're, we're not relying solely on, f on these funds to offer comparable services in our non-Title I schools as well. And we have to, and this is probably a really key one for you to, to know about, um, we use these funds to supplement, not supplant. And when we move things out of federal funds into a local budget, we can't then use them in the grant the next year because that would be supplanting something that we paid for locally. Next slide. And this is, in some ways, a. Um, a reminder or reinforcement of what I just said. So to, um, we need to make sure that our parents know that they have their rights. These rights are articulated in parent school compacts and they're the ways that we operate anyway. We have all sorts of mechanisms to partner with parents, um, both at the classroom level and at the school level to make sure that our, our, our parents and families are really partners in education with us as we're working together to support the achievement of our students. Um, we let them know through school handbooks that they have rights around knowing qualifications, um, how their kids are doing, to uh, engage in, in meetings and meaningful two-way communication. So, um, so this is that opportunity to just remind them. Yeah, thanks. Go ahead, Stephen. Title two. Oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Title II Part A. Title II Part A is um, a source of federal funds that we get that really, um, for us, supports professional learning to ensure that we are supporting our teachers and administrators to do their best work in support of our students um, and improving our students' academic achievement. Next slide. Our allocation in our original application before our carry forward funds came through was $122,000. Um, and the, we have, <laughs> those funds keep dwindling. Um, and so we do three things with our Title II funds. We dump them into school-wide programs uh, so that I can fund the positions we've committed to funding. We fund an instructional coach for the district and I give Orchard Valley, I work with them to figure out their professional needs so that they get their equitable services allocation. Um, so right now in the original application without carry forward, I didn't have enough to fully fund our instructional coach. So she's currently funded at 0.67. And when I amend the grant in the next couple of weeks with our carry forward, I'll fully fund 1.0, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that um, as we close the presentation. And then equitable services with Orchard Valley, um, they've engaged in some literacy training, that's Orton Gillingham training, and then they have um, some extra funds right now that they, they're not sure yet what they're doing. They're um, in continuing to engage in their comprehensive needs assessment so that I can write other investments in the grant for them during the amendment. Next slide. Title IV, Part A, the purpose is threefold for Title IV. We get funds to support students so they can access a well-rounded education, um, to improve conditions for students' learning and success, including um, safe and healthy schools, and to promote the effective use of technology and digital literacy. Next slide. So again, our original, um, our, our, our allocation in the original application this year is $59,000. Again, we do three things with that money. I dump a tiny amount in school-wide programs this year. Um, we support our restorative in-school experience uh, or RISE coordinator E32 with this money. The RISE coordinator's position is to support students academically, socially, and emotionally so that we increase our graduation rate. 
and students stay in school. And then equity, uh, equitable services for Orchard Valley, that's their full allocation for Title IV, and they are engaging in some neurodiversity training this year. And again, in that original, sorry, Stephen, go back. Um, in that original application, I only had enough carry, um, Title IV funds to, to fund that position, 0.45 FTE, and I do have carry forward, and we'll amend that, but that will bring us to the next slide. So in my budgeting approaches over the years, um, since 2012 when I started this position, I've, I'm conservatively quite, um, I'm fiscally quite conservative. And so I have um, counted on carry forward each year to, um, to the maximum that I can to fund our needs and to create a safety net um, in the event that we don't, the, the funding doesn't come through. Because we obligate, we offer contracts to our employees and we plan budgetarily before all of this happens in the, pre, in the spring of each year. And I have um, sort of reached my breaking point with carry forward. So that's important for you to know. We do not have enough money in the grant to fund the RISE coordinator this current year 1.0 FTE, and we will have a RISE coordinator 1.0 FTE. So we're going to be using local money to make up that difference. I am going to fully obligate almost all of our funds, except a little Title I, probably. Um, and so we, I won't have carry forward to make this. So when we're talking about programmatically what we want and need in this district to realize the goals of the strategic plan, you will be seeing things in the local budget, likely. Um, that you haven't seen before because I'm running out of grant funds to fund them. Uh, between our salary and benefits increases and a, a federal assessment that the state takes for federal grants for salary and benefits, we, we've sort of maxed out. <laughs> done it, I've strung it along for 12 or 13 years and now we're, we're done. So I just, it's really important that you all know that because, and the um, not getting that homeless grant also impacts it because we have a need and a, a moral and ethical obligation to get our kids to schools when, um, when they have that right. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that as we lay the groundwork for budgeting in the weeks and months to come. And with that, I would, um, I would love to have any questions that you have, any feedback that you have about our, our title uh, programs in Title I and, um, and let you and the public, when this is on, online again, um, the video up to know that you can reach out to me at any time. So questions, feedback? Patrick and then McKaylin. Yeah. I have a question about the um, using free and reduced lunch as a, a way to gather information. Um, the last couple of years, lunch has been, uh, meals been provided um, for kids, and, and so have you seen a sort of tail off in the response rate of those um, those those surveys or those those forms, and so how does that affect um, how much yeah. money we're getting? So we can we, those numbers have fluctuated since Universal Meals. We had been encouraging folks to to complete those. Um, those applications. There, there's also a household income uh, application that people can use, and the state generates that number. Free and reduced lunch is not the only measure of poverty that we can use, and so um, I engage in, a, in, a, um, in an activity called ranking and serving, which is part of the grant, where I look at, I can look at lots of measures of poverty to figure out um, what what is reflecting the communities the most and how can I crunch the numbers to, um, to also get what we need. So, um, so yes, it's fluctuated over the years, but not so drastically that, um, that schools, that I, we can't do what we've, we've committed to doing. Does that help? Yeah, it helps. I just wonder if moving forward, if, it's a, if, if there's a different metric that we should be using as the, as the benchmark, even if, if you're already doing a lot of things in the background. Yeah. Because um, I just wonder, it, you know, even if people understand that it's a helpful um, tool to, to, to get federal money, it's still one more thing that, that parents have to do um, that, that maybe, they, maybe, maybe some won't, and so we might miss out on some. some yeah. Money. When I, um, I, 
I examine every year how we do ranking and serving. For example, um, years ago, the system that I had inherited from my predecessor looked at a composite of both FRL and Medicaid. Um, and so we could crunch those numbers that way too. I was realizing at the time that, um, that Medicaid, the way that it was working then, wasn't actually necessarily a measure of poverty. And, um, and so then we, we moved with some advance notice to straight up um, FRL numbers. And this would be another opportunity as the grant comes to look at what are our numbers, are they a reflection, Great. are there other approaches? That's part of what we do every year. Yeah, thanks. thanks. McKaylin. Um, I, I just wanna make sure I'm understanding this clearly. Um, these are additional positions that are being funded, so so beyond what would normally be allocated to each elementary school. For example, the Berlin, the 1.6 in literacy and 0.6 in math are in addition, they're on top of whatever would normally have been distributed to Berlin. So Berlin has a total of uh, four interventionists and what is that, 2.2, is that what my number, 2.2 are funded with federal money. But if that's 2.2, that wouldn't exist if Berlin wasn't needing this additional assistance. They would be, the need exists, but we would not have, we don't have, we would not have federal money to support that need. But I guess what I mean is we're not just like using this money to then like, like these are the positions we have anyway and this is the money we're using. They are actually additional resources directed towards these schools. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Um, hold on. Can I see Daniel Lay. Lay, did you have a question? Did I see you? I do have a question. Yes. Daniel Lay, Chris. I was going to ask um, is there a technical definition for highly qualified <coughs> paraeducators? There is, indeed. So there are three ways that a, a paraeducator gets highly qualified. Two of them are related to post secondary coursework that they may or may not have. Um, an associate's degree, a certain number of credits in particular areas like education or human services. And then th the third is a local, uh, an opportunity to create a local pathway or a local assessment. And so um, I worked really hard <laughs> with Heidi, kudos to Heidi in particular, for really going through again because we've had so many changes in paraeducators in, in the recent years and there was a local pathway that it just became more complicated, I guess I'd say for the sake of simplicity. So we developed a new local pathway um, and made sure that all of our paras met that, either criteria A, B, or C. A and B being based on their post high school experience, educational experience, pathway C being a local assessment that we created. Sorry, so is our goal that all They must all be, all, all paraeducators who provide instructional supports in Title I eligible schools must be highly qualified. Okay. I am required to report that every year as part of our Title I participation report. And we have worked harder here to make sure that all of our paras are highly qualified because then we have the um, ability to, and flexibility to reassign if necessary. Mm. Yeah. Thanks or for them to move when they want to, right? right? Yeah. Okay, Play. so uh, based off of that actually, I, where, is the, uh, where is that definition coming from or did I miss that? Oh, it's part of the, uh, it's part of the federal uh, law that defines what a highly qualified paraeducator means and, um, and how, what the pathways are to get there. And the state collects data because they then are accountable to the federal Department of Education. Okay, and then my first question was connected to uh, Patrick's was like, have we, have you or your office done anything, looked at any other metrics, like have tried to do other metrics and they just seemed not to work or was that, was that just like, the best one to go for at that time. Yeah, and that's why I'm, we've gone with it continuously throughout the past decade or so. 
Yeah, so we did look at other metrics when I first got here. We looked at a mix of, of weighting med Medicaid eligibility and free and reduced lunch rates because sometimes we didn't have people who filled out applications for various reasons. And when that data started to not quite ring true as a measure of poverty, and we'd been promoting the, app, the completion of the free and reduced lunch applications, then I felt better about that being a measure of poverty. And we've used that for many years since then, probably at least, I'd say at least eight or nine years, at least, we've used that measure. Um, there are some other measures that exist, but they're, they don't really apply to us. They, they, because they're federal, they're sort of larger systemic ways to look at poverty that we just don't have the same access to, to data or we don't organize the same way in the state that I haven't looked at. But I am required to also attend training every year so that I make sure that my knowledge is up to date. And that's part of what we talk about is this whole ranking and serving process so that I understand how best to approach it each year to meet our students' needs. And then actually, uh, is there, is because of the, uh, uh, the state law of universal meals, is the free and reduced lunch still applicable to uh, the funding? Like, just because, like, maybe people just aren't doing it because they know that their children, regardless of what is going to happen, regardless if they do it or not, then it just might seem like they're doing another piece of paper that they don't have to do. So yeah. are we sure that that is a good gauge? So the state has also been um, the state's also been working on a, a form that's called the household income form in response to the universal to the fact that we offer universal free meals. So the state's been working hard to um, to figure out ways to support uh, families in the field to get accurate data um, as the legislation had changed. So yes, there's another measure out there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. And Chris, did you have a question? I did. Um, so the funding for the RISE position will expire this year? Grant funding? Uh, it won't expire. I just won't have enough money to fund it at 1.0 going forward. And um, I won't know my allocation till the spring. And if the other things keep increasing, like health benefits, for example, right, that we sort of beyond our control, then I'm going to need more money to support other positions as well. So if, if the um, part of the rise position comes into the general budget, does that then become a supplant problem? It does. So does that say we should really be funding that with more? It's so hard to know, Chris. And I, you know, the other thing is, I don't see our our title allocations radically increasing anytime either. So this, these are some of the important decisions that we're going to need to make um, as a team and bring you recommendations and talk about how they meet your parameters and that you'll wrestle with as a board um, overall, right? So this is a source of funding that um, that's just not going as far as it's gone in years past. Is there any other position that uh, falls within this funding problem? Uh, the instructional coaching position is one that if it's solely supported with Title II, I, I worry about sustaining with full funding. Right now, I mean, Suzanne and I, we're trying to figure out how close we are and if I can just sque squeeze it in with the amendment or if we're going to have to start allocating it partially to local money as well. Those are the two major ones. Um, yeah, because the Title I money is, um, because they're the ones that are funded with no Title I money at all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jen, we have Suzanne, oh. and then I have a question. Suzanne, do you want to unmute? Yeah, I, I was just going to add to what Jen was saying about the free and reduced lunch. Um, we do get direct certification numbers from the state now. And that actually has increased our sort of reporting. And what that means is students that are directly certified for free or reduced lunch through other uh, things like Dr. Dinosaur. And that, that puts them in that category and allows them to be counted. Thank you, Where Susan. we're getting fewer forms, we are getting a direct certification. Thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. All right. 
It, oh, you have another question. Go ahead. I, I do have one. Another question is that uh, so the intention of the rise coordinator is to uh, uh, is for students to stay here, obviously, and graduate, hopefully. Have we seen a consistent, uh, maybe like a growth or seen something consistent with that the RISE coordinator is actually functioning like it, it's supposed to? Yeah, that is a great question. Because people like, might be concerned that, the t well, if we're starting to put this in possibly into local money, then people are like, wondering are we getting anything from our local money or do we or do we rely on that federal dollar uh, to do the rise program yeah so that's a good question that's actually Becca and Lisa and I are working right now on the next report to the Ed quality committee related to the high school graduation rate and other outcomes for students post-secondarily. That is, in, in a, the RISE coordinator is part of a team of educators at U, and administrators at U32 that support our students. But we're crunching numbers now and getting ready to share with you all at the Ed Quality Committee meeting what our most current outcomes are for our post-secondary you know, post for our kids. Um, and some of that d uh, data we can have locally, but we don't get uh, um, we don't get it officially from the state until after after a period of time. Sometimes the state the official state data lags behind our informal numbers, but we'll share what we have in the weeks to come. Yeah, thanks, Laura. With the recent closure of the motel program in this past two weeks in October, have we seen a rise of homelessness in our students in our in our in our district you know, Vermont is number two in the nation so just since we were talking about it I'm yeah. wondering thanks for asking floor we have not received any new notifications in the last couple of weeks but <coughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if we did still in the coming weeks floor, we, we, we should probably note that the students in the motel program would already be considered yeah. homeless yeah, yeah. Because we've been seeing an increase in our child care and pre K. So I was just wondering if we were. If, go ahead, Elizabeth. Yeah, so, um, sorry. Um, so that I understand, Title I funds are for students who do not qualify for special education but have academic need. Right. Yeah, you cannot use Title I money to provide IEP services. That doesn't mean that you can't support students on IEPs. It just cannot be an IEP service. Okay. And so for the schools that don't receive Title I, my assumption would then be that for the children that need additional academic support, the funds would come out of the local fund. Correct. So we have we fund plenty of intervention positions across the district mm -hmm. to support students who have a need for more targeted and intensified interventions. That's not special education services. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to thank you so much for this presentation. Yeah. It's really You're helpful. Welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. It's the most people who have ever attended the Title <laughs> I meeting. Thank you all. <laughs> How do we, because it's, it's a different, right? How do, how do we balance that transparency of use of public funds if we don't have access or it, how do you How do you monitor you know, quality or, and I know that it's not your responsibility, but so, so how do we? It is my responsibility for the, for the monies that we um, end up, well, we don't give them to Orchard Valley. I manage them for Orchard Valley. We're actually forbidden to give money directly to the independent schools. So I meet regularly with personnel at Orchard Valley. There's typically a point person or two um, to figure out what are the needs of the teachers and the students at Orchard Valley. And then, for example, that math tutoring, that math tutor is our employee. Um, and they work at Orchard Valley. They're not Orchard Valley's employee. I employ a math tutor on behalf of Orchard Valley. And then the neurodiversity training, for example, 
I do all the procurement with the support of our business office and I broker that contract and I get invoiced and I pay and they're responsible, um, we're responsible for taking all sorts of documentation including an evaluation of the effectiveness of the training, oh, okay. Okay. attendance, all of those things. And there are all sorts of um, parameters around what is and is not allowable for those activities. Um, and so we make sure that all of that, there, there's a mutual understanding and that we're only supporting allowable um, activities. And there's a pretty intense vetting process at the Agency of Education too. So the grant has to be approved and that's done by a review team at the state. And if there's something in there that's not approvable or allowable, they kick it back to us and we need to change it before it gets substantial approval. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's really good to know. Thank you. <coughs> okay. It, let's, thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Now let's move to the next part of the agenda. I, it was gonna, I was wondering since you were previous it, principal, if you would allow our students to jump in and then we do, or do you want to go? I you're going to be. I think that's an excellent idea is to let the students do their report next. I, I hear there's a, re a valid reason for an early one. It's my mom's birthday today. Yeah. Happy birthday, Mr. Happy birthday, Mom. Okay, so um, we're going to start out our report. Uh, not so positive note. Oh. There we go. Do you want to start yeah. it up? I, I don't know what you just want oh, to start no. off with. <laughs> Everybody's getting sick. It's that time of year. So just remember to wash your hands, uh, drink some tea, whatever you got to do. Um, and then, of course, it's almost that season. Report cards are going to be coming soon. We got some tests for everybody coming up. I just had midterms at Norwich, so it's going excellent. Um, <laughs> it's homecoming week. Do you want to cover some sports stuff? Um, so uh, the U32 football team is going to have their homecoming and senior night on uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. against Spalding. Big game. Super team. Uh, all other sports like soccer, track, I have no clue what, cross country, <laughs> I don't know all of them. Uh, we'll uh, have their games on Saturday, the 19th. Mm -hmm. um, then, not related to sports though, uh, school picture retakes are October 22nd, which is t next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And then we have a craft fair coming up on November 9th. Yeah. It's not for a while, but. Yeah, we probably okay. could move that to a different one, but okay. whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and then. I'm not yeah. quite sure what that uh, next thing is, actually. Uh, go for Launch, which is some kind of STEM program uh, between November oh, yeah. 2nd and November 3rd. Uh, applications are expected by October 28th. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. just a cool extra program. I guess I don't really know about that. Um, then auditions for theater. We're doing stage 32. Those are on October 18th, which <coughs> is Friday. Super exciting. <coughs> um, and then, well, we're getting gear. Well, like seniors for me at least. We're, we have to apply for yearbooks, do our senior pictures, senior quotes, everything. Um, and then, of course, like Leigh was saying, it's homecoming week, so we have all types of themes we're doing. We have school spirit, all that fun stuff. Um, also unrelated, but um, this is another sports thing. Our girls team beat Harwood last night, 2-1, double OT. It was an amazing game. Just had to shout that out. And then the boys soccer just lost 3-0, um, which is extremely unfortunate, but um, it's okay. Um, on Friday, we have a super fun, um, we're doing like our pep rally. So every um, varsity sports team is going to do a dance, and it's going to be really funny. Um, and then we were also asked to talk about the phones and school policy and how that's working. Um, I have a few quotes from students which are on my phone, so I'm just going <laughs> to really quick. Excellent timing. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I can say that the general consensus uh, for students on the phone policy is that 
the initial backlash was uh, uh, obviously there yeah. because we've never had such a strict, at that time, phone policy. Um, I think for some students it's come to the realization that it's actually been a bit better for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard from teachers and <clears throat> teachers who are like speaking to each other. I've overheard some conversations about how it's doing much better for them. They don't have to constantly put, say, put your phone away, put your phone away, and do all the reminders and paperwork for all that kind of stuff. And I guess also some people are thinking about it now where like some places are, it's a more prevalent issue around the country and that we have uh, in some of our social studies classes, they're introducing that some, uh, some state legislatures or some state offices are proposing complete bans I know that in Virginia and Florida they've proposed those, or like in Pennsylvania, I think, like Philadelphia, they have like the little pouches. pouches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people are like, oh, maybe we don't have such a strict policy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've, um, I've talked to a few people and like Lay said, it's like, we're getting to understand it even though it wasn't always, um, people didn't always like it. Um, I have a quote from a few students. One of them said um, that they understand the phone policy in class, like while a teacher's teaching, and that they appreciate being able to have it, or they appreciate being able to have it during passing period lunch and free bands, but they do feel like that um, if they have to talk to a parent, that they, sh they should be able to do that on their own personal phone just because they feel like um, it's a bit of an invasion of privacy if they have to go down and like go to the office to communicate with their parent. That's just what one person said. And then another person said that they think it's helpful to keep everyone on track. They said it's super helpful to be able to use it during lunch and passing periods. And then this is from a younger student and they said as an athlete and a student without a car, it's super important for me to be able to use it during passing periods and lunch so I can communicate with my parents. I don't think students should get strikes for having their phones out before class starts. If a student was to walk in with their phone in hand, I think it's unfair for them to get a strike. Overall, I agree with the phone policy and think that it's been helpful and productive for our learning. So, it's been working. People, I think, have been a lot more focused during class. When I was in U32 last year, I noticed that, I mean, just like not even having the option, like you're not gonna think about it, and obviously it's gonna make everybody a lot more focused, a lot more like zoned in on what they have to do, and I would imagine it's been helpful for teachers because it's not another thing that they have to deal with. Um, so oh, yeah, that's our thoughts. That's a student report. Any questions? Zach. Do I understand correctly that the musical is going to be joint between you and Montpelier this year? I actually don't know. Yes. 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 <laughs> that's, wait, that's so cool. <laughs> just just, for, just for, for future reports, I'd be interested to, yeah. to hear how that goes and how that relationship works. Yeah, totally. Works. That's awesome, mm -hmm. actually. I totally didn't know that. <coughs> Any other questions, yeah, comments? Yeah. Stephen, are you uh, gonna sumo wrestle at the pep rally again this year? Or? Oh no, 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 that's <laughs> for the current <laughs> administration. <laughs> 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 I was going to say there is something very, truly wonderful and new planned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for, for being here. And we, we had talked about, a, I know you're working on, on this now of trying to get more voice from the elementary schools too. Yes. So, you know, just at the next meeting, just report how that is going. And I know you and Willow had some plans that got in hold, but just to bring that back and get yes. uh, into that. Yes, I will definitely. OK, great. So thank you for being here. Feliz cumpleaños for your mom. I will tell and feel free to go if you need to go. Please stay if you want to stay. Okay? All right. Bye. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So now we can go back to number four, and we have a brief update from our superintendent. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to save you about uh, 17 minutes of time here. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, Suzanne and I actually attended some trainings uh, last week around uh, budgets with the um, 
the Vermont School Business Administrators Group and the Superintendents Association. Um, got some updates. Uh, I just wanted to um, to let you know that we are we we are really trying to listen to the the feedback that came from the configuration study time period, and um, and really bring to the board. Uh, a better understanding of the frameworks that we have, how we are funding those um, supports for kids, and really looking at um, like our instructional model, our um, our intervention model, and our uh, special education models, to make sure that when we present to you um, how we are supporting student needs within the schools, that we um, we can show how the budget is directly related to that. Mm -hmm. um, there were also questions around um, which are discretionary and which are not discretionary funds, um, and so we're going to try to break that out as well to, to give the the board a better understanding of that. But also, we're we're really trying to focus on building a budget as opposed to cutting from a budget. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're really building this from the ground up right now, and that's why it's taking us a little more time. We, we were already on an aggressive time frame for our budget, um, and uh, as we sat in training last week, no other school had shown a budget yet either, um, and so school system, and so we were, um, we felt good about that, but we are, uh, we, the leadership team has met a couple of times. Uh, we're meeting again next week to really try to uh, nail down our first numbers for this budget and be able to provide that to you. Now, um, the other thing that I also want to bring to you is that um, there was a question around uh, configurations of middle school. That was a big part of our discussions in configuration. We are, we are not going to propose any movement of the sixth grade to U32 for next year, uh, but we are actually talking about what is the two year, um, what does it look like, um, and, uh, and as part of our budget building process, we're looking out not just this year, but what does it look like for next year. Um, in our configuration. And we really want to talk about this in terms of the programming that we're going to do, not just the budget that we're going to do. And I think that that was what we were asked for a lot of um, as we were presenting this information. And so I, I hope that we're able to, um, to show you some of those pieces. I also just want to say that at this point in time, we really have no idea what the tax implications are uh, for, for any budget. Um, we, you know, we gave you some extremely rough numbers that I can tell you aren't even close anymore. Um, but we will know more. Um, the, a date to highlight is the De December 1st tax letter is when we first uh, really start getting some solid information. We will bring you a budget before that um, for us to start looking at. We, we, our, um, our goal is to get feedback from the community on November 6th. Uh, November 12th, uh, really bring the, the full budget to the Finance Committee, and then November 20th, the full budget to the board um, is, is what our goal is right now. And also, just to let you know, in December, we also will have the grand list and the CLA available from the AOE. So in December is when it really starts to gel together, although we won't know the yield until towards the end of the legislative section for all that. I also just want to, to, to preview that um, our programs are going to possibly look different as a result of this budgeting process, um, but we are um, going to focus on creating opportunities for students, um, and we're going to really try to make sure that we can illustrate how our monies are tied to the students themselves um, within the schools and, and within the programs that we have. Um, if you've been paying any attention to the news in the last couple of days, there has been another study that has come back out. Um, I actually remember when it came out 10 years ago, and that was the PICUS, I think that's how it's said, um, um, Auden study. Um, I, I encourage you to go look at the Vermont Digger article to get a start with it. It's 133 pages of report. <laughs> um, so I know there's some people around this table who probably spent some time looking into it. Um, and so, um, so, so that's, that is um, a report that's been given about the structure of schools and funding of schools and best practices. Um, there are some things to it that um, I think are valid for us to think about. Um, I'm not sure about the structures. Um, they call for very different structures than what Vermont has at the current time. But it is worth uh, taking a look at least at the Digger article to, to understand that they, they have a good uh, summary. And then the Commission on the Future of Public Education. I put a little note in the, um, in the Colt report about the Commission on the Future of Public Education. I think there are two dates that really need to be highlighted out of that group, and that's the preliminary recommendations are due from the Education Finance System Committee in December of this year. So they're supposed to give some preliminary uh, report on ways that we can save money, Spend less. I don't know. I don't know what their recommendations are going to be. They're going to, to going to be giving us those. Their formal recommendations won't be due until a year from December. 
So December 2025 is when they'll give their formal recommendations. And so I think those are just, um, th that will create some big talking points in December um, when they issue that. Um, so just kind of a heads up on those kinds of things. Any questions for Stephen? Oh. Hearing none. Uh, Thank can, you, everybody. Yeah, so we oh. can move to the cult. Oh, oh, no, I can do it in the cult report. Yeah, yeah, in the cult report. So okay. in the cult report, we wanted to do a couple of highlights before we ask for questions. Stephen, you were going to... Yeah, uh, one thing that I want to just highlight right now, and this is a big shout out to Suzanne and her team, is we're doing our audit right now. So just in the middle of budgeting, we also have to do an audit. <laughs> um, so um, they, are, they are working nonstop to make sure that we uh, get through our audit. We expect everything to be good. Um, so a big shout out to her and her team for all of that. And um, I was going to have her the yep. principal's report. Um, You're going to have Becca highlight yep. something? Mm -hmm. Becca, are you, can you hear us? And then, yeah, Spencer can give you a mic. Hi, everyone. <coughs> um, so you have the written report, um, and in a moment I'll invite if you have questions, but a couple of things that if you haven't noticed, it is homecoming week. Um, and one of the things that is great about homecoming week is that our PEP um, committee is sort of what I'm calling it, because it's not so much a squad, is um, really a diverse range of eighth through 12th graders right now, and they have taken on this um, week as, as really a week to instill spirit. It's a really, it's a large group of students, and they are sort of from all places in the school community. And so this year we expanded our hallway decorating competition to the seventh and eighth grade um, and are really thinking about the structures that help support the kind of community and culture we want to build while also allowing for student voice and choice. And that has a lot to do with sort of um, what's on our minds um, as we think about moving into kind of just some tweaks to systems. And one of those tweaks is around our, what we're coming to call our third space. Um, time during callback, so things like clubs, but also included affinity groups, leadership, um, co-curricular teams in some places, and so we've done some work with student council and with um, faculty and club advisors to really define those spaces, and then um, in collaboration with student council, they were kind enough to put on our third space fair, which is going to be upcoming, and create um, a space for um, information to be shared around what those activities are. And co-curricular activities are really an important aspect of our culture at U32. And so being transparent and open and inclusive around those um, and defining those has been a huge part of what our work has been alongside sort of student government work. Those are my highlights for now. Do come to the bonfire if you can. Um, come with your student, even better. Um, <laughs> just stand aside, it's okay too. Um, and we're excited about that, we're excited about just a, hopefully it'll be beautiful this weekend and welcoming lots of folks to our campus. Any questions from board members from the cult report that is always so wonderful to read? Any? One question. Yes, Daniel. I was looking at the uh, the food service RFP development, which sounds like an, a good development. Is that, that's in the cold report? Yeah, I think so. Page 26 in the packet. Mm -hmm. And I was just hoping that if it's possible, this is sort of directed at Suzanne, if it's possible to get from other school district business administrators some comparable numbers on like what um, what districts who have food service internal to the district spend on a per pupil basis on food and what um, school districts who do contract spend on a per pupil basis. Um, that would be interesting information and also any sort of if anyone's recently transitioned from one to the other, what were the motivations and experiences around that? I don't know how useful that group of school business administrators is, but since you brought it up, 
yeah, mm -hmm. m might be useful to tap them in this case. Mm -hmm. yeah. Question noted, Daniel. I'll, Thanks, I'll Suzanne. track it down. Yeah. Yeah, um, and Daniel, that highlights another thing that I didn't really mention with uh, the budget is that we're really going to try to show what the service delivery model is that we use in each of our areas. So things like what is our service delivery for transportation, for food service, uh, for curriculum, for special ed, so that you as a board can see what are, you know, how do we deliver those services and where might we have the ability to change that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So now we're going to move into, we already did the student report. Oh, sorry, Chris. Um, Suzanne, this is going to follow up on Daniel's uh, question about the food service. Could you also identify which um, schools, if any, have a farm to school program? Um, just because I'm, I'm assuming that if there was a different model of delivery that would impact that um, or coordinate with it. But I, I don't know. I think it would be good to know what schools do have a, a farm to table or farm to school program yeah. and you I may was, know well uh, the short answer is none and all but really none um, we we organized Erica's in the audience tonight and Erica and I uh, with some support from Keeley also and um, and Karen Lieberman um, we organized a, a convening last year of, in, of staff across the district to talk about what people are doing in different schools mm -hmm. around farm to school programming, not directly related to food service, but more generally like programming and integration into the classroom. And we hope to do more, so stay tuned on that front. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process of incremental change, I would say, because it, um, if you try to integrate it into the food procurement, you're talking about serious money, potentially. Okay. I just was wondering if there was anything up and running now. Sounds like not. Yeah. Center now. Patrick? Yep. Um, so the thing I want to talk about for the Career Center today is... Um, um, some of this w information is in a, an article in the, the Times Argus on the um, the tenth, I believe. Um, but it's it, it re it's in regards to the um, the career center looking for a new space, um, but then also talking about the, the ramifications of um, if the career center does have a new space. Um, there's a there's an acknowledgement on the the part of of uh, CCVC that that if they do um, have a new space or when they do have a new space, they'll they're, they're going to be taking um, the, the, the kids that would participate in those programs would, would, would then not be in their, uh, their, their kind of traditional um, high school. And so they are uh, kind of grappling with the fact that, that, that they'll be um, moving, moving people from one building to another building um, when, this, when this happens. Um, their, their, their timeline for, for a new building for CCVC would be um, something that would go to the bond that would go to all of the the contributing towns um, all of our towns are contributing towns in in 2025 and then they would have a hope to have a building finished in 2029 um, the superintendent uh, Jody had a, a meeting at uh, or went to a school meeting at um, which, yeah it's part sorry Twinfield, Twinfield right yeah. and um, and, and talked about this uh, as well as um, potential, um, the potential for a regional high school. So a high school for, for all the contributing towns or, or most of the contributing towns, um, given the fact that, that, that a lot of kids would, would be going to the, the career center. And, and at the Twinfield meeting uh, floated U32 as the place that would be a sensible um, solution to that. Because this building that we're sitting in today is a new building, it's not in a floodplain, and and um, has uh, capacity for for most of the kids already um, that, that potentially would would need a regional a high school. Um, she also pointed out at this meeting and then at the board meeting that, that she hasn't had formal discussions with anybody um, with with anybody. But I suggest that we invite Jody to to talk to us 
Um, the, the, this idea that, that U32, either the building that we have already or our campus would be part of a, a broader solution for CCVC and, and potentially this regional high school is something that, um, that's being talked about a lot and I think we should get in on that conversation. Um, so, so let's, yeah, let's, I don't know that now is the time for, for, for us to hammer that out, but I think we, need to, we, should, we should consider inviting her here um, or, or setting up a, a subcommittee or, or, or some, some group of folks that, that um, formally um, heads this off or, or, or formally, just formally has this conversation and sees to see what can be done. Thank you, Patrick. Now the next, uh, re uh, there's any questions for Patrick? Okay. So the next report is the VSBA report. I'm gonna do a really super quick report, but I'm gonna add a little bit more than usual, just because it's coming, you know, the conference is next week. Uh, and uh, Ursula, uh, Stephen, and myself are going. You know, everybody got the emails. We didn't get a lot of uh, responses, but I wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things. Uh, just put out the president's report for the year, but three things that I wanted to highlight that are important for us is that we, we launch a membership survey uh, this year to try to gain some insight into how our communities are made. So, you know, what is the diversity within our school boards? How can we better serve our school boards? Uh, hopefully a lot of you participated. The results will be shared at the conference and then I'll be able to share those results with you. But I uh, just wanted to, you know, say thank you for those of you that it filled out that survey at the beginning of the year. It, the other thing that we talked about at the, our Justice Coalition meeting, but we haven't really talked about it at our board meeting, is that the VSBA participated in a collaborative effort with VSBA, VPA, VSA, NEA, AOE, I know there's a lot, so teachers, principals, you name it, everything, education, education, uh, and others do in sh uh, on, a, on the first edition of our of a EQS report, and it's aimed to really help us have ensure alignment with the state and local initiatives for the changes that have occurred in EQS. And when, for that, I mean uh, the work from Act One and the IRIS framework. We will talk more about it at one of our meetings, but that's one thing that I wanted to hi highlight. And. Um, and then we have been talking as a board in our retreat about the district quality standards, so I'm not going to spend any time on that, but I would like you to look at your recent emails from the Vermont School Association and take a, take a look at the task force report on collaboration to benefit all students. The recommendations from that task report are be of interest to everybody, and they were around mostly uh, to expanding and maintaining a comprehensive data dashboard. We don't get data, accurate data, and data when we actually need it from, 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 the, from the AOE. And then uh, also utilizing uh, better communication between the Agency of Education and the State Board of Education. So uh, how to improve the capacity both at the Agency of Education and at the, the State Board of Education ac accountability and, and cooperation among all collaborate. I've been trying to find a better word for stakeholders because I've been made aware that it's not a good word to use, but if you guys have any ideas, um, I'm all ears on that. Um, and that's it for that. We're going to look at our resolutions, uh, our resolutions later. We have expanded also a lot of webinars, especially for our newer board members. Take advantage of the webinars. Uh, you can watch them anytime and you can sign up for the webinars at noon and then have access to the recording. So with that, let's move into, is there any questions? Okay. So uh, budget discussion, so board operations. So moving into the budget discussion, as uh, Stephen just shared the timeline, so I don't know that we need to repeat that at this, uh, at this moment. But we included in, in the packet the parameters and the criteria, uh, just to make sure, you know, to, I've been saying this at our configuration committee meeting, to have a mutual understanding of where we stand, right? And make sure that the criteria and the budget parameters, uh, that's what they're working with. So just a thumbs up from the entire board. The <coughs> configuration committee got to give it the thumbs up. I don't know if there needs to be any discussion, but after our last meeting, it's my understanding from listening to you guys that the parameters and the criteria still stands for our leadership team to use for budgeting purposes. Is there any 
concern with that? Hearing none, we affirm our budget parameters and our criteria. I just want our administrators to have clear guidance and not be wondering, right? Yep. Especially because we just had that meeting. That, okay, so I'm gonna gain some time right now and give it to the important work of our Ed Quality Student Monitoring Report. You had a full report there, but. So you had a full report in the packet. It starts on page 37 and it's on the spring student achievement data on math and reading, so literacy. And I'm gonna go through the how we're doing, what are we doing, and then there are more details further in the report. But our students are making the expected progress, however we're having, there is a performance difference between subgroups. Our economically disadvantaged students, so free and reduced lunch, and our students on IEPs that continues to endure. It's the same achievement gap that's been there. It's continuing to be there. We look at student performance relative to both proficiency and growth in order to understand how we are moving forward towards that goal. The district currently uses iReady data and we've started using the Acadians reading as defined in our local comprehensive assessment plan. In the report there was a link so you could go look at the whole comprehensive assessment plan and our assessment tools are being used to inform action plans and intervention plans at the school level. So I'd open it up to questions anybody has. Um, it's a slightly different format than last year, only that we moved a lot of the supporting documents and definitions to the back um, to clean the readability up. I'm reading. So I guess the questions I have for you guys, if you don't have questions on the report, are what stands out to you? What questions do you have about our analysis, about the data? Do you agree with the analysis? What other implications for the full board do you see? And I'm taking input on the format because we're working on narrowing something down that will pretty much be consistent every time you see it. I have a format request um, to have an N, like number of kids on when it's appropriate. I understand if it's too few kids, it's not appropriate, but, but you know, if we're looking at differences of 100 students or five stu or 20 students, it's really important. So. And some of the charts that are not in here but are in the full report that you can find on the meeting resource page, we had to leave blank because that end number was too sure. small. Because. Thanks. Anybody else? Yes. About, well, there, there's a reference in the system challenges to the expiring grant funds. Do we have like a sense of the scale of the new, like are, are those expiring grant funds used to support the local comprehensive assessment? Do they represent 5% of the cost of that or 75%? Jen, do you want to speak to it? I mean, some of that grant funding Jen spoke to earlier too with that Title I. Any, okay. Yeah, so we, we had a, thank you, Spencer. We had a, um, an ARP ESSER benchmark assessment grant. It was about $23,000. The vast majority of that money we used to, um, to access professional learning about reading Essentials K-6 in the Acadians assessment. And for two years, we also were able to leverage those grant monies to pay for the assessment itself. So that was last year and this year. It's just under $10 a student, and we administer it K through six. So I, I want to say it was about $5,400, $5,400 that um, we are going to need to plan for in our local budget because that grant has ended. I just wanted to say I like the format a lot. It's very easy to access and look at. Um, something that stands out to me, and I don't think this should be self-explanatory, but maybe it should be, um, is the significant difference in children proficient or above IEP versus non-IEP. I think that, to me, speaks volumes to the complexities 
of serving children who are on IEPs. And I just think that that's data that we really should look at and think about. And as a board member, for me, it would be really helpful to understand those numbers a little bit deeper um, and why they, why they look that way. I'm sure, again, there's reasons for it, but that is something that stood out for me. I have a clarifying question. Yeah, go. Um, so where it says like eighth grade and it has the, is it the 2023, I'm on page 41. Thank you. Um, is that the, is that when they were in seventh grade? Is it, so it's, it's two different cohorts. so, okay. That's what I was trying to figure out. Right. So there's longitudinal cohort data and then there's, I gotta find my page. I want to get it right. Feel free to jump in, Jen, too. Oh, okay. so, oh, right, cross-sectional analysis where we get different students across years, i.e. last year's third grade and this year's third grade, which is right. what you're seeing in that table. So it was last year's eighth grade and this year's eighth grade. And for the reading, it would have been last year's third grade and this year's third grade. Yep. Um, longitudinal cohort analysis data is where you can see the same students over multiple years. <coughs> We are just starting to collect our data over time, and so we'll be able to look at that in the future, but we don't have it as of now. Yes. In regards to the cohort development, have you identified cohorts of children yet to, to follow that longitudinally, or do you know what I mean? Like, have you started with a kindergarten class that you're gonna be monitoring over a long period of time, or are you still in the development process of that? You want, yeah. Yeah, hold on to it now. There, um, so the answer is we could follow just about any grade, but we have looked at the data, the iReady in particular. We can graph sort of um, both performance and growth over time by grade level. And there are a couple of grade level point that grade levels that we're concerned about overall. So, for example, in the Ed Quality Report from the, from the previous month, um, our grade our current grade five cohort is a cohort that um, is is seeming to perform lower than other cohorts, and their growth seems to be lower than other growth cohorts. And when we think about how old those kids were during the pandemic and the impacts of the pandemic, that's a group in particular that we're paying attention to. Um, we also know that often um, our students in seventh grade perform, their performance looks like it dips a little bit. And by eighth grade, it, it kind of bumps back up. And we, we posit, <laughs> there's some hypotheses about that in terms of just where um, social emotional growth might take precedence for our students when they're coming to a new school with lots of new um, classmates. But those are the things I think at Ed Quality that we'll talk about in terms of honing in on what are the cohorts that we want to follow over time and how are we going to follow them. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I would point out the indicators, if I'm right, the indicators that we have are the equity indicators yeah. uh, that we're reporting on here as well. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, Chris. Um, when, when Can you use the microphone? Oh, it yes, just helps. Okay. Um, are there specific um, programs designed to address the, the differential between free and reduced lunch and non free and reduced lunch? Are you talking about programs that would address the performance yes. gaps? Yes, I believe that would be our multi level systems of supports that we enact, and they're at the school level. They take this data and take a much deeper dive. They look at the school level, they look at the classroom level, they look at student levels of achievement, which we don't get to see because it's outside of our realm of what we look at. But at the school level, they take these deep dives and then they create their, in, you know, plans of attack, I guess, is what I would say, is how they are going to teach their kids and what levels of support each student needs in order to meet their goals. Okay. In, in the charts that are comparing um, IEP and non-IEP students, um, are the free and reduced lunch students incorporated into the non-IEP 
criteria. Or into the IEP. I mean, they're in oh, that. Oh, could be both. Right, right, they could be both. You could okay. have students on an IEP who also are free and reduced lunch, but it would, that is only, like, the IEP table separates them out by the IEP. Mm -hmm. Free and reduced lunch separates them out by free and reduced lunch. Okay, thank you. I have a comment. I, I like the I like the format, in, and I really like it, it, it to also to have those highlights, the video, and those things to help you know spell out what multi-level layers of supports is, and all of that is really helpful to have it in the in, in the report. It, I am I'm wondering it, since it, this committee meets uh, the beginning of every month, and we are usually rotating if doing something related to kid talk or, or this could be our nice area of focus. You know how last year we did social and emotional learning. So maybe do more something related to each school that is more in achievement. I, I don't know, in, you know. Like multi-layer system support. Well, yeah, understanding or? the multi-layer system of supports or I, I don't know. This, the, so, you guys can. So we already have an idea. Oh, you um, have. Okay. okay. So Sorry. we're um, we're going to be presenting on math programs oh, and um, and really taking good. into this. Yeah. Yeah, taking these pieces into account so that we can talk about some of the performance and the and the interventions that we use and um, and how we identify um, need and meet those needs. Well, perfect. Mm -hmm. That's from my point of view. <laughs> okay. Uh, anything else, Ursula? Um, I can direct everybody to last year's data report when we talked about it from Ed Quality's meeting. Um, when we looked at the fall data, Jen organized a bunch of the teachers and leadership team to talk about how they use the data in each of their schools, which was a really f helpful understanding of how they use it because they go deeper than we do. Because we look at it at a district level and they get to look at it at a school, classroom, and student level. So that would be in our meeting resources page. That's it? That's it. Okay. Unless anybody yeah. has any last time burning questions. Okay. So then we're going to move into our next. I have to go all the way to the beginning because I was So now it's configuration, uh, configuration next steps. Uh, I actually forgot to do the three bullet points that I actually do with the committee before we get done, but I'm gonna do my best attempt to share uh, what, what we just shared with the configuration committee and then open it up for, for, next, uh, for next steps and just bear with me for a minute. I, I'm wondering if people need like a five minute, go to the bathroom and then we come back yeah. here. Mm -hmm. Sure. And we start that last period. I, I think we should be out of here by with luck by 8.15. Or 8. I don't know what it is. We were hoping. Sure. Yeah. We're now going to talk about a configuration. When we, when we started the meeting of, of configuration, just to give some background to people that were not at the, at, the, at, the last, the, at the last meeting, we started by just saying, you know, the Washington Central Unified Union School District were decided on October 1st not to move forward with the configuration proposal. However, we would continue to work on a path forward that aligns with our strategic plan and with a clear focus on proposing a financially sustainable configuration that supports both our curriculum and culture goals. Strengthening existing connections between families, students, and communities remains a priority. Our hope is to establish a shared understanding and an agreed upon reality of where we are today while remaining committed to those objectives. Uh, as we move forward with this work, the configuration committee met today, October 16 at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, and we want to balance the work of the pressing demands of the budgeting and the operational duties that our administrators already have with our, you know, also uh, wanting the continued support and creative input of our communities as we navigate these challenges ahead. So with the configuration, I'm just going to do three highlights, and then we can all give input to the configuration uh, committee. If I move away from title uh, one, oops, sorry, too many notes. 
So what we what we did as a cooperation committee was like yeah, let's look at it, what can we agree or what is our agreed upon reality. Most of you were here, not all of the board members were here. And please, configuration committee members, jump in if I'm <coughs> not remembering everything. So we agreed that uh, that we're gonna that, and the board just agreed to this uh, too that the configuration criteria still stands. Are there any of the board members? We already said this when we talked about budget, but there was agreement, so I'm not gonna ask that question again. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, hold on a minute. I need to go back to my agenda here. So, yeah. And then we, we agreed that the budget uh, that, that the budget reality that we are dealing with right now is is, is dire, uh, but that we're going to continue to to work uh, together with the administration, and that we are in that together. It's not the administration versus us or we versus the administrators. We are doing this work together. The most important uh, agreement or uh, agreed upon reality is that we all agree that we want to fulfill goal three of our strategic plan. There's copies around and online for the board members that were not able to be here. And that, that goal is to foster and commit to responsible leadership that engages the community and communicates transparency, transparently. And the action steps under that goal, two of them highlight the work of the Configuration Committee, the Finance Committee, and the board, because we all stand behind the strategic plan, is uh, Washington Central Leaders will propose a financially sustainable configuration plan that supports the curriculum and culture goals, and um, Washington Central Leaders will create and strengthen existing connections between families, students, and communities. Um, and then, you know, like all of the goals there are applicable, bullet one, two, or three, but those were the two bullets that we were concentrated on. Um, we agree that we did not make the case for for the configuration as, as it was. That was another thing that we talked as a, as a whole. Uh, we also talk about the, you know, that it, to be clear, and one of the other things that we needed to be clear was what is the charge of the configuration, uh, of the configuration committee. So that's another agreed upon reality that we all need to be behind. And, uh, 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 planning for transition was uh, was, in, was important. Uh, the meeting uh, uh, expediting or uh, the meeting with Montpelier and, and Trueville is also important. Uh, uh, one of our board members brought up uh, the idea of having external help uh, to look at, uh, and we talked about like either we had somebody familiar with the district come back that has already done an efficiency study for us or what is that, a help from outside it looks like. And I'm, sure I remember, I'm forgetting one. Yeah. I, I think that was it. That was it. OK. So with that, we can open the conversation to, to all of the board members and, and, and mainly just make sure that we are all in agreement that as a board, we also stand behind you know, that goal number three of our strategic plan, those two bullets. I don't need everybody to speak to it, but at least thumbs up that that is the case. I want to see either all the thumbs. All right. OK. And two thumbs. Julia, did you cut a thumb and I missed it? OK, good. All right. So next, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next steps is uh, deciding on a meeting time getting clear on the semantics of uh, the charge. I'm looking at the configuration committee. People are here uh, mm -hmm. with me. We will continue to use uh, Jeannie on facilitation, but looking to see if we needed more external help mm -hmm. uh, for as we move the, the work ahead. And then making sure that we are not, uh, that, that we're working with our, uh, it's not just dependent on finances, this was the semantics things that we went back and forth, but that we continue to move forward <coughs> with our uh, budgeting. And that, uh, oh, the one thing that I didn't mention was that, you know, everything is on the table right now, and that was, and that was clear, and by everything is on the table, what do I mean, Chris McVeigh, I'm, qu I'm quizzing you, could you hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah, what yeah. did I mean? Not what did we mean, because it's not I. What? 
What did we mean when we say at the Cooperation Committee that everything is on the table? Well, if, well, that was what was stated, and I was confirming that everything is on the table. It means, I mean, we we have a tough budget, so there's nothing that's sacrosanct. Is my would mean everything's on the table to me. Um, every uh, facet of the budget would be explored okay. uh, and determine whether. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So, questions, thoughts. I just had one quick question about the composition. Is the is the configuration committee just solely made up of board members at this point? No. No, it's made out of two members of the leadership team, one principal of the high school and one principal of the elementary school. Okay. So Alicia Lightford is the principal from the elementary school, and now we welcome Becca today as a member of the high school because Stephen, who was there, is now our superintendent, so he already has a seat. Does that make sense? It does. And but no members of the community. So we, we talked about that. So that is, uh, that is open for conversation. Mm -hmm. Chris. Uh, Jonathan, are you making a proposal? Well, I think it's certainly important to, if not elicit, uh, input from the community to help advise the, the committee. Uh, possibly, I think it would be wise to um, recruit and or accept members of the committee or members of the larger district community that might want to be on the committee, given our last votes on the consolidation proposal that we, all of us collectively, have put forward. Yeah, I'm in agreement with that as well. I think, I think there's so much to consider and think about, and I think that the voices of our community was were very loud, which is good, and I think that's important for us to understand, hear, absorb as we're moving through the process. So I would really like to see that as well. Chris. So, um, given the current composition of the committee, how many community members would be workable? Um, because we should, if, if we're going to do this, we should do it now because we're moving forward again and rather ha have everybody in on the ground level and starting as opposed to later. Um, at least when we're having a preliminary discussion. So given, given the numbers, what do you think the number should be? I, I, without Putting all the names outside, you know, I, I wouldn't say more than no more than two people from from the community. Otherwise, okay. it would be, I, I think, unmanageable. I think you're right. I think yeah. so. Um, I'd like to make a motion to add two community members to the configuration uh, slash finance committee um, <laughs> for and, and and have folks put in um, letters of interest, and then we can. Um, Evaluate those and pick two. Second. So, Chris, did you get that, Lisa? Yeah. And second by Daniel. Any, any more discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. So, so with that, I just want to clarify. Oh, oh, Kelly, you had a question. Sorry. Sorry. It. Okay. I, okay. No, so, it was my fault. I should have the hand raised. I was looking at you, but I didn't um. look at. <laughs> um, I, I. I totally agree that we should have community members on the on the configuration committee. I think that that is smart. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about just having two and which communities they will come from and whether that's going to cause issues. Um, like maybe we should have one from each community. Okay, but if you get more than two who want to be on the the configuration committee, how are we going to choose? And if it's, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, if you guys can figure out how to do that on the configuration committee, that's fine. But I, I'm just throwing that out as a hand of caution that it's going to be political and it's maybe challenging. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, Kelly. It's just really hard to 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 manage and bring together a group of people that is that is, is already large enough. So I think either 
if we could have less board members then into that committee and we go down to just having one board member per, per town uh, be part of that committee. And I think that the board members have been involved in the uh, ultimately are going to also represent those communities too. So we would have to develop some, some criteria for, mm -hmm. for that or, or see who is underrepresented too on the on the configuration committee and what that looks like. I think it would be good to get together with the steering committee and see what that could possibly look like so that we can put a post as soon as possible in front porch forum. I personally would be a little hesitant on adding another five people to the, I, I, but it's, you know, we would still need, because this doesn't, adding people to the configuration committee doesn't take away the importance of reaching out to the community as a whole, so it's just to bring people to, to be part of the conversation, but it doesn't take away from our responsibility to be, to be engaging with the communities as a whole, right? So it's another thought partner. It should not be just, uh, I, I almost feel like these two people should be representatives at large of the committee, and it shouldn't, at large of the community as a whole, right? Not uh, just Worcester, not just Middlesex, but uh, another hand up, uh, Michaela. Which towns do the administrators represent that are on the committee? Administrators, they I mean, don't, they don't lead. I know they don't represent the community per se, no, but no, you were just mentioning community, yeah. board members from multiple board members from each community. <coughs> do the administrators live within one of the community no. towns? No. Neither of them. Uh, Alicia lives in Orange in Stephen. Oh, oh, oh Becca. In the district now. Becca, yeah. And so, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, she lives in, she does move to your point for, if you're going to try to make it even in the towns, then it should be even among, maybe. Yeah, but I wouldn't want our administ neither of our administrators to feel like they, especially our administrators, shouldn't count for any of our towns. Right? In the, but we all represent all of the towns in our towns. Exactly. So, right, so your so point as to the board members then should just be the same as the point of the administrators as well. Okay, so then it means that two people should be okay too, right? We don't need five. And we need fewer board members in this? No, I'm just, <laughs> Is it just like. A, I'm just saying, if you're going to like tally up town members, then just do it for everyone. Yeah, and we don't, I don't think we want to tally board members. That's what I was thinking. If we just added two people, it would be at large members <coughs> of our community, How not necessarily. Right I don't remember. It's a very number. It's a very number because some people come and are not, you know, like we have encouraged all board members to come if they want to stop by. So we had the finance committee and then we added one member of each town. Remember? The, yes, I know. I was the Worcester member. You were the Worcester, we were the Worcester member. Yeah. So, 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 yes. So, I, I don't, what, so the people that are, that are, that are here, Ursula, um, Michelle, Chris, myself. Daniel. Yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight. Yeah, we were nine, um, and uh, plus our superintendent, uh, ten. And then we added <coughs> two. <coughs> two, two and, no, we administrators are already on that, on that group. So if we added two, we would be a committee of 12. Or we could add three, and we're a committee of 13. My favorite number. Plus Diane. The what? And Diane. Diane is also Diane. one. Diane, so 13, yeah. So it just starts to become like almost the size of the board to put it together. Hey, Daniel. I was just thinking that some kind of, um, when, this, when this committee is reorganized, there's going to be some uh, inequity of representation on paper, like inevitably. And so I guess I think that um, being really explicit going in with some sort of affirmation that everyone is representing the entire district mm -hmm. is, is like an important step to be explicit about that going, going into the process so that everyone, you know, brings that, that goodwill and demonstrates that. We had oh, Patrick. Well, yeah, I've got another uh, another semantic point. Uh, apologies, but um, I wonder if 
the the configuration um, discussion has been understood by the community as a discussion about how uh, about closing schools, and um, if we could ch name it something different uh, moving forward, as that is not um, not something we're not we have time to entertain um, for for even if it was going to be uh, because of the, the time for ballots it'd be in to, just to better understand and better describe what the what the committee uh, is going to do and 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 that it is district wide um, I think would be helpful to get um, community buy-in from, from what the what the committee would would suggest I don't have a suggestion for so you, you talked about possibly with Daniel we were going to partner and work on the charge of the committee. Right. Maybe we can propose a couple of like name changes to the committee to bring to our next so board meeting. We talked about this, this committee also holding the, the conversation about merging with other districts, okay. which is obviously distinct from closure of schools and also the importance of distinguishing this committee's importance and focus on reconfiguring um, as a, uh, ex exclusive of, well not exclusive of, but separate from financial priorities. And, and we're really looking at the draft criteria. Uh, I mean more, more, needs, more work needs to be done to develop it, but we talked about how it's been problematic, the like ambiguity around to what degree was was the charge of the committee driven by financial priorities, and that needs to be clarified. Is the, is part of that driven from the fact that it's, it overlaps with the finance committee? Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. So why, why don't we separate it yeah. from the finance committee? We talked about doing yeah. And we could then make it a small, potentially a smaller group, also of board members, if we were looking to have more community involvement in the last few board members. Do we need formal action to separate it from the voted, finance? We just we just voted in in adding two community members. Does that still stand? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because we approved the motion and we voted. Otherwise, we need to. We do that. Yeah. So I was just asking, do we need formal action to separate it from the finance committee, or can we just? Again, I think it was still just a semantics. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like I don't think anybody said it's definitely a part of finance. Well, finance committee, like the small finance committee, could like, for instance, approve minutes of the configuration committees. So we really did, it was really uh, It was an expanded, it was an, it was an expansion finance. of that committee, yeah. but when we talked about it, it was simply that that was the committee that had capacity to take on another meeting. Yeah. yeah so that's why it got put on that committee, and yes, it was an expansion of a committee that existed. Yeah. yeah. And I think part of the reason it was housed there is that, you know, in order to put the resources to where our values are, so it came to, like, you know, how do we, again, organize ourselves to be able to deliver the education because I'll start about students right so let's talk about the charge uh, and then bring back to the board uh, some proposed changes Does that work and That's we would have yeah. okay yeah. okay and okay and what's the next one Quality we did, configuration next steps. Is that okay with the configuration steps? When we are going to try to figure out which uh, times uh, to meet and, and all of that. Okay. Uh, the DSBA resolutions are in page 45, and we typically go through them to give guidance to our voting member. The, the meeting is online this year. Everybody can attend our. Our voting member is the one that has access to not being just like in the webinar, but it would be part of, yeah, you get to vote. Um, but I'm going to try to move quickly. So we'll be hosting this meeting tomorrow at 6 yeah. o'clock. <laughs> so I'm going to go just quickly through the resolutions. You have them in, in, front, in front of you. The resolutions is really what guides uh, uh, our executive director and and all of the BSBA in order to, 
to uh, advocate at the legislature and know what are the positions of our members uh, are. Every year we get a few resolutions that add to our continuing, we have continuing resolutions and resolutions that stop every year. It, this year, it was my first year in not being the chair of the resolutions committee because that's the vice president's job. So, uh, but I work with Tara and we have five resolutions there that you can uh, that we can go over. So uh, <coughs> resolution one, I'm just gonna stay in the in the last part of the of the late of the language because I don't want to read the entire entire language and my iPad is at ten percent. So resolution one was submitted by the Norwich School Board. The language in the resolution says the VSBA calls upon the General Assembly to examine the impact and feasibility of raising the non reservation tax rate to the same rate as the home tax in every town where there's no reservation tax rate is lower than the homestead tax. The VSBA calls upon the General Assembly to examine the impact of the non residential tax rate and homestead tax rate in every town where the non residential tax rate is lower than the homestead tax. That's kind of double there. But uh, the board, so the resolution one, uh, the, the, the resolutions committee voted to uh, to pass as a continuing resolution. That is just a recommendation from the resolutions committee. I should have said that, but all of the resolutions got get put in front of everybody, and everybody gets to make up their own mind. Uh, uh, and why we did this is uh, is is because there's approximately 85 towns in Vermont where the homestead rate is greater than the non residential rate, and there is a concern that this creates adverse incentives for homes to be purchased as second homes rather than uh, homestead properties. So uh, so it's just calling right now really for a feasibility study. Uh, we you know not, it's not an immediate action, so it is at least the beginning of something. So what what would be the guidance to our you what? Well, I know, but you know, it, is, it takes time. You, know, like, you, you need to you need to come over, Daniel. Um, okay. So, what is our guidance? Will at the board so as far we, as so do thumbs up to pass. So, so yes. or ask questions. Yeah. Well, this board recommendation column. Which board is making that recommendation? That's the VSBA board. Oh. So, like all of the resolutions goes through the resolution committee. And then they get presented to the whole VSBA board. Okay. And typically, like last year, we had a chart that told us what the committee recommended and what the board recommended because on a couple of them they were different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, and we changed that process a little bit this year. Sometimes it is it is different. Okay, but what you guys are voting right now is basically giving direction to Ursula. So you could look at this in isolation of what we as a 24 member. <laughs> Board uh, voted on right. What we want is your your true sentiment <laughs> on the resolution. If you are okay with the resolution, we advise our voting member to vote yes. So we 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 pass this resolution. But I'm not trying. I I, I don't want to use the the language that we move to adopt. You know because that's what I'm doing tomorrow, and we're not adopting. We're just recommending. So okay. thumbs up that you're okay with this resolution. Yeah. Strop off. Yeah. Strop off. Yes, that's the right word. Strop off. Okay. So moving to resolution two. Uh, just because now I'm kind when I told you that I'm going to let you out. Uh, uh, resolution uh, two was submitted by Lake uh, Region Union High School. The resolution has the following language to an existing resolution. The agency should gather input regularly from local districts to assert to ascertain how the data collection process could be improved in order to make a more make it more useful for inform, for curriculum and program development, uh, make it more useful for evaluation curriculum and programs. I'm skipping the evaluate the usefulness of the data and identify possible ways to streamline the data. Uh, the agency should report regularly to policymakers, educators, and public on what the input is. Uh, the BSBA board a recommendation for resolution. Uh, two was to not take any uh, any position, and the reason for for that was because we we already that task report uh, for collaboration for all students, which was a resolution that we had the year before, already addressed uh, and had recommendations that I was talking to you about the data, and so it's already been taking care on that and also because of the work that the Commission of the Future of Public Education is doing right now, so that's why it was. 
that the recommendation was to not take position because it would just be the will of, of you guys because the work was already being done. So, so if that's our will, I would abstain. So I either get to yay, nay, abstain. Mm -hmm. Thumbs up as in a uh, take no action no or for an opposition. All right. Thank you. Okay. And then I'm not being very good at looking. I always see when Julia has already brought her thumb down, but please talk, both of you, if I don't. Okay. Uh, resolution three, uh, WSBA applicates, uh, well, the resolution three was submitted uh, by the by the resolutions committee every year. The resolutions committee also sees things that have gone through the legislature through the year. And uh, Natasha, is there something? No, okay. Uh, good, okay. Okay, the language of resolution three. The ideas we have a case for legislation that will require the Agency of Education in consultation with the Agency of Digital Services, Division of Artificial <coughs> Intelligence to take all needed actions necessarily for the responsible use of artificial intelligence in Vermont schools. This may include model policies, guidelines for use, and code of ethics. Uh, the VSBA board recommendation for this resolution is to pass as a continuing resolution. Yeah. And why the VSBA recommended this uh, this resolution uh, in, is because we uh, we have seen uh, we have been called to testify several times, uh, and we know that we're going to be asked to testify again. So we wanted to have guidance through the year. So are, are you okay with this passing as a continuing resolution? Thumbs up. Yep. Okay. I see two, two. Okay. Yep. All right. So resolution four is also brought by the committee. So the VSBA supports legislation that will require school districts to adopt a policy concerning use of cell phones and other personal electronic devices in schools. The policy shall address at a minimum the specific circumstances or, or time periods during which cell phones or personal electronic devices use is permitted when their use is prohibited and any relevant expectations of instances such as this ability, accommodations, medical need, or other emergencies. Uh, the recommendation also was for this resolution to pass as a continuing resolution. Uh, again, the reason, similarly, we've been asked to testify, and we, the conversation nationwide is pretty broad, and, and we just participated. Or, uh, go ahead, Natasha. Um, I was just going to say, this actually came up in the policy committee about should we create a policy, and um, Chris, correct me, Amelia, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm remembering this incorrectly, but where we kind of landed was, we have procedures in place and those procedures are working. Yeah. And the administration feels good about the procedures and the students are starting to feel good about the procedures. So is it necessary to create a policy around something like this? So I'm just questioning, like this is saying it will be required to have one. Mm -hmm. I'm just questioning whether it yeah, being so that policy. So. Yeah, I actually just presented, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, that's because in the current situation of the people who are here now, that's how it is. I think that the board would want to consider a policy that covers for all, all time, right? So it's because you have an administration that that is the procedures that they're putting in place. And so if it's the will of the board to have that kind of policy, it does give reinforcement to that kind of work. So I. Because we don't get to tell them the procedures to have unless we put it in a policy. No, I understand. I'm yeah. saying the conversation in the policy committee yeah. was we did not feel like we needed a policy because we trusted our administration to uphold the procedures that they created right. around cell phone use. Yeah. And so. I, I agree with that. Natasha actually just presented at the Eastern Regional Meeting in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and very much based on the way that we do it. And, and it was not the most popular point of, of view because there's a lot of places that have moved to pouches and are more. You know, I, I, I love the agency that this gives to our students and they, you know, be able to monitor themselves and learn how to work with technology. But that doesn't, it, it, does, it doesn't work for all communities, right? Because in some communities, some, administ some administration might be trying to do this work, but are not able to do it because they have a lot of community um, that, that won't. So, yeah. so at the end of the day, it was just for student out, so have a guidance. So whatever is the pleasure of the board is just for the 
for that for we're just to have a guidance of how to deal it's, with the, that. it's the word required. You know, I mean, we have a lot of policies that we've put in place because we feel like they're appropriate that aren't required. So school systems could put a policy in place whether it's you know whether it's required by the state or not. Okay. So that and that's just that's that's the that's the word that I'm kind of stuck on is that it will now be required. I wondered if having that, this resolution put it in the school board's hands as opposed to putting it in the state's hand to come up with like a state policy which would then be for every school which it might not fit well every school. So if we have a resolution that they're advocating that every school board comes up with a policy, it allows at least the local school board to control it. That was part of it because there is some lobbying going on for that. But hey, Chris? So is this, um, are these resolutions subject to amendment tomorrow? Yeah, you can give it. You can you can give definitely give uh, give input to it, and then the other thing to to think about that is that this is not something that is in law, right? It just gives guidance. So right. it is it is guidance. It's not something that is going to be advocated as written, right? It's just guidance for them. So we could say to Ursula today, we we like the idea of policy. We just please bring up that require is the question for us as a board. Well, and so. And following up on Ursula's um, comment about not having uh, the state create the policy, but leaving it for the local board to create a policy um, for their district, as opposed to one size fits all, because one size wouldn't, right. I don't think. Um, Which is sorry. what this resolution is written as, is that it would be school it's boards school making board, that. Right. Yeah. But ensure that that's what we're advocating for, as opposed to the state creating a policy. And that was the reason part of the I mean, reason the state that may this require came. require one, but not a specific one. This doesn't right. say the state can require any like, language. Like it's not telling you what language to use specifically. It's saying that you have to have a policy. No, I understand. But at the school board level. Right. Like, and then, and my my caution is that it be that general, create a policy. School board create a policy as opposed to implement this policy. I'm following up on your lead. Okay. Actually. Okay. Okay. I just, I was like, are you asking me to edit anything? No, and I'm like, no, I don't know how to edit no. this because that's just, how it's written. <laughs> I'm good now. Julia has her hand. Oh, 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 sorry. No, I didn't know you. Julia, go ahead. And then Amelia. Oh, I'm not sure that I'm going to add anything useful at this point. I think people have already said everything, but but perhaps not. The policy, the policy could be. Students can use cell phones whenever and wherever they want. It's we get to the school district gets to decide. So if legislators say school districts have to adopt a policy concerning use of cell phones, we have flexibility to make that policy um, as we wish. Right. So I have I have no problem in supporting this. We still have the control. Could if I'm be, reading this correctly. Yeah. Could the board decide not to have a policy or have a policy of no rule? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Yes, yes. Cell phones are allowed all the time. Well, I just wanted to speak to Natasha's point that, that um, you know, I think that adding in flexibility and also if we do decide, I think we should talk about it, you know, amongst the policy committee. And then if we decide to follow the guidance because it is flexible, maybe we can have the procedure inform the policy of what it is and have it be, since we, periodically revise policies, have it be written in there that we revise it perhaps more often according to certain general recommendation and the effects on the health of data that we have that's up to date. Um, can I just ask a question? Yeah, and please. I, I, that all sounds fun. I'm not, I'm not pushing back on the fact that there are districts who would, might want to <laughs> put a policy in place around cell phone use. Um, what is, because I know that we get like model policies from VSBA that are not required, but they're like, here's a suggestion, mm -hmm. and you can choose to use it or not use it. What is the push to do something different than that? Like, in, as opposed to VSBA saying, we have this model policy, it is available for, for districts to implement around cell phones, and they can expand upon it if they want. Why is there a need to say, you have to have a policy? as opposed to just leaving it, we will give you examples of, of good policies, and you can use them if you want to, or you can continue to abide by procedures. I'm just wondering why that, why there's a conversation about why that is not a good enough thing 
and they're wanting there to definitely be a policy. Let me read it again. So the resolution says the. Uh, is that the resolution committee submitted? I recommend this resolution because we recommend that the BSBA have a position on cell phones in schools in the event that we are asked to testify. Right? I'm just giving you the the reason that we brought this uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of movement in the state, in from some of our own community members, that uh, that there is a ban of cell phones, so a law, not just a policy. Right. So I think that's why it was. Uh, is it is it also because of what's referenced above, the concerns of mental health symptoms of depression and anxiety? Yeah, so there's different, th there's different groups, and, and it's, so yeah, that's I'm why. Not, I'm not saying that yeah. there should not be. No, 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 no. I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just curious about why there's a push for it to be required as opposed to VSBA saying, can VSBA not testify if they don't require it? I mean, can VSBA still testify and say we think this is a good idea, even if it's not required? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's just so that it's just that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Daniel, you're good. Okay. So I can I just take you at the end of the so meeting much. Yeah. to like figure out how you would like me to address that. Just but I think we need to give you guidance as a full board. Oh, yeah, so, board. So, so, so right. one of the guidance is like you know bring up that if it needs to be required. But I think we're all okay with the resolution. As a whole, right? Yeah. Or as a generality, as a you're generality. Okay with it. Yes. It's that requirement yes. versus yes. It's that requirement. requirement okay, and then we have a unified vote yes. going back. Is that okay with everybody? Yes. Okay. Rephrase that again for just because the, the resolution is a requirement. It's saying pass legislation to require policy. Uh, but again, to Patrick's point, policy could be, or, or to maybe Julianne's uh, point, you can use cell phones. Because it says you have to, resolution points out specific things that need to be addressed in the policy, but it doesn't say how they need to be addressed. So, so this resolution is saying to legislation to require a policy be implemented. And I'm actually I'm fine with that, but just for clarity's so purpose. My understanding is we're saying that we have no problem with a policy or resolution. We have a problem with the word use required. So, yes. so that's the guidance that we're giving. Okay. Join yes. and, and we trust Ursula to vote with that guidance. Mm -hmm. Okay, resolution number five, because I'm making it really late. Now, resolution number five is the Vermont. Okay, back there. Okay, thank you, McKenna could tell that. I was like, wait, did I? The Vermont School Board Association poses the following underlying language be added to uh, 3 BSA 2702 regarding the appointment of the Secretary of Education. With the advice and consent of the Senate uh, and the governor, shall appoint a secretary of education from among no fewer than three candidates. Proposed by the State Board of Education, the secretary shall serve at the pleasure of the governor. The secretary shall report directly to the governor. So here's the language. At the time of the appointment, the secretary holds an advanced degree in education, public administration, or a related field, shall have a held position of teacher, professor, education administrator, or equivalent position. The secretary shall, and then it goes onto including knowledge of public education policy and practices and familiarity with the school governance uh, structures. You know why this came up. I, I don't think, think I, need to ex <laughs> I don't need to explain I it to I you guys. I could add, and if, if they say don't appoint her, the governor can't. <laughs> yeah, but I know that we can't <laughs> add that into the resolution. <laughs> So, so this is like two thumbs up? No. Well, How many thumbs up would you like me to give? Oh, 17. I, I'm actually a thumbs down because of that reason. I think the more the more important thing is is to prevent the gover governor from overriding, uh, you know, uh, an unfavorable reception from the Senate. That's that's the, and then putting them at a temporary appointment. That's the bigger problem for me. Like. I, I see I could see a lot of scenarios where someone without a higher degree is the best person for the job. Mm -hmm. This particular appointment doesn't seem to be that case um, by all accounts from all evidence, but <laughs> that's 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 sort of problematic language to me, I guess. I would love to have a different secretary, I think, but um. I think 
including the knowledge of public education policy and practice at That's, the bare minimum yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is, is, yeah. is huge. So yeah. I think, you know, with not have, right now none of this language is there, in, and I think we're, it, it is a little bit more helpful to at least have, it might not be getting to all of the points, but at least it advances in, in the right direction, because it doesn't mean that all of that is going to go uh, through, but I think we, we do need a better process. And, you know, if we could have everything, you know, the way that we appoint the secretary already is problematic, so we can go on in a tangent about right different zero. things. So at least it's the right, in the right direction, that would be my so can we give her 17 thumbs up, I think I heard? Or, uh, everybody? Yeah. Kelly, yeah. yes? Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, that concludes the, the resolution, the, the, the bylaws now. No? Yeah, there's the whole existing resolutions. The, there's a table, page 53. It's my next. Oh. Sorry. Sorry, I Okay. So. A lot of times these get yes. passed as a we are gonna pass a whole it. slate. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think last year was the first year where we pulled one out. So at the beginning of the meeting, I will ask if anybody wants any of these resolutions uh, pulled out. And uh, so the resolutions that you see in your packet there, marked with an asterisk, will, uh, will sunset if no action is taken by the membership at the annual meeting. Uh, so. Yes. So if you see the 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 slate, would you be uh, would you be willing to? Did you have a chance to review it before tonight? Would you be willing to approve it as a slate for Ursula to vote on it? Yes. Are we? Thumbs Are we up on the table. table? Mm -hmm. Thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. All right. I don't yeah. see any thumbs down. Okay. So. So then, everybody's okay to to move forward with that. The resolution is recommended by the VSBA board to be, okay. And then I already did the, and then the bylaws changes are very small. I'm just trying to get to that document. I've got it right here. Yeah, do you have the, yeah. So, the so we're on page 59 with the VSBA bylaw updates. And some of it is really simple, like taking out last year's dates, and then they're looking to add like a updated date at the bottom. Um, Article two, vision, missions, and goals, taking out some text, adding some text, um, adding or supervisory district, because we have both supervisory unions and supervisory districts in the states. On page 60, under the Board of Directors, they're looking to remove the titles of Vice President and Treasurer. It doesn't change the composition of how the Board of Directors would be. It just gives them flexibility, is my understanding. Yeah, so the, yeah, right now it's just the, the way that the, you're talking about the Vice President and Treasurer. Basically, that was the one that was the most confusing for everybody, but those already exist. So if we added those, it would be adding members to the Board, so to stay within the same uh, members, that's why we're proposing uh, that, that change. And the last uh, proposed by law change in Article 8 uh, is in officers and their duties. The word will will be changed to shall. And, and there, there's three places in the, in the order to be consistent with other language in Article 8. Uh, and those were the only. They were really simple by law Very, very simple by law changes. OK. Are we okay with those pilot changes? I'll probably bring them up to the meeting as a slate <laughs> tomorrow. I will gonna review each one, but then vote on them as a as a slate. Laura, okay. Yes. Is there any substantive difference between will and shall? You're the lawyer. What I'm asking you. I mean, you're the one, <laughs> you're you're the the one proposing you're the change. change. It should be consistent. So what? shall. Just consistency. Will consistency. Consistency across the document. 
Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're trying to put that one on. Okay. That, that is the end of the, the VSBA yeah, resolutions and bylaws, and then we can move to use policy committee. Yeah, let's go. Um, so we have three policies up for consideration. Uh, a second reading for the educational philosophy policy. Uh, and um, I, I want to give a thank you to uh, Natasha for a lot of her work on the policy committee, particularly in relation to the uh, second policy that we'll consider, the um, creating learning environments to engage in civil dialogue um, discourse policy. Uh, she's very instrumental and helpful with that, and I think um, it was great. Thank you. Um, so first up, though, we have the educational uh, philosophy policy, which is here for second reading and adoption, um, if it's the will of the board. Just, just so you know, um, the fifth core belief was left off, so I added that. And then it was we were asked to spell out what I was stood for, and so that's also added. Can you say that again? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the fifth core belief, the humanity, justice, community, and belongings, was not in the original philosophy, so I added that. And then it was requested that IRIS was spelled out, so I identified what each of those letters stands for. So that's, so those are the only two things that came since you last saw it. And IRIS is spelled out um, on the uh, creating learning environments um, policy um, on the back. If you're interested in that now. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Why does this policy not follow the same format as the other policies? It's the philosophy? Yeah. Well, it's a philosophy. It's not a policy. It's not a policy. <coughs> cool. Okay. That fixes that. <laughs> Do we have a motion to adopt? Any, any other questions from anyone other than Ursula? <laughs> <laughs> I move to adopt the education philosophy. Second. Okay. So moved by Patrick, second by Ursula. Any other questions mm -hmm. to the policy committee? Seeing none. If all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion carries. Okay. And the first reading, go ahead, Chris. So next up, we have the Creating Learning Environments to Engage in Civil Discourse Policy, D24. Uh, and this came to us um, initially through the um, Great, Great School Partnership. Uh, and, but it went through significant revisions. And thank you to Melissa for um, highlighting the divisions, the, uh, the changes in red. And so this is a, a first reading, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, for your consideration and comment. Oftentimes we see a much longer list for that for that sort of stuff. Is there a reason that you that this that this is you know narrowed down to a smaller group? I'm sorry, could, could you repeat your question? In the when you do the sort of what's basically like the anti-discrimination statement, you know, sort of you know, you say regardless of skin color, ethnicity, social background, or zip code, 
oftentimes when we're sort of doing these categories, there are a lot more categories. Is there a particular reason why it's, you know, why it's you know, these four? That's that's what was recommended in the Great Schools Partnership. Um, I feel like we had some conversation about possibly taking the list from what was like in the EQS, which was a very long list. <laughs> um, and I mean that is absolutely something that if you know the you know the EQS is now lost. I mean if that's something that we want to um, use, we can very easily substitute that list and make it more inclusive. But my, my concern is that by having a short list here, when there's when there are long lists yeah. elsewhere, it yeah. implies that certain mm -hmm. things, the things are excluded or excluded for a reason. Yep. Yeah. Good point. Okay. And good it would make it more consistent with some yeah. of that, the other policies that include the longer list too. Sure. Yeah. And it would be consistent with better unlocked, which is what yeah. we did for EQS. Yeah. Go ahead, Elizabeth. That's easy. Um, yeah. Only easy ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you easy. It's just words, <laughs> semantics. We love talking about semantics. Um, in the first paragraph at the end of that, discussing controversial subjects, I felt like changing it to topics. Subjects just, I'm not sure that necessarily addresses like the broad spectrum of what could be addressed. Um, and then also Washington Central Unified Union School District embraces the concept I, I feel like understanding as opposed to contact might be a s concept might be a stronger, <coughs> again, encompassing piece. And then at the end or the middle where it says, um, by establishing these environments, we can encourage meaningful conversations about important, and I changed that to topics again. Issues. It was <coughs> issues. I changed it to topics. Where Take it or mean? leave it. Um, yeah, it's oh. in the fourth or third paragraph at the bottom where it says meaningful conversations about important topics. Uh, third, 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 third. Did I say fourth? A little tired. <laughs> We're good. Sorry. Yeah. That, that was the it. word idea might also be substituted for concept. I personally like understanding better than idea because I feel like idea is very nebulous and <laughs> kind of, um, and understanding is. Yeah, yeah. I feel like understanding kind of solidifies that, like, that's shared, that's a shared action. A good call. We need to have, like, so Washington Center embraces that public schools need, or we need to have the, the idea, the understanding. What was that coming for? What, what was your comment? Sorry. No, we're just repeating. Oh, she, oh yeah, okay. Just okay. okay. Any any other uh, comments that we'll bring back to the committee and then return this next for another reading and adoption? So there was one other thing that we had talked about, and that was fast tracking this policy. Um, and I brought that up with elections coming up. Um, I just think that it would be, if we can, to fast track this so that um, our educators across the district are already engaging in conversations about what's happening. And this would just allow them, I think, a little, <laughs> a little support when, when having those conversations. Um, so I don't know what that process is to fast track it, but I, if, we can, if we can try and do a second reading prior to our next, because the election's coming up pretty soon. Would doing a second reading like at the first meeting of the month work? Like, after. Yeah. Oh, it's after. after. Yeah. 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 So we could, we could approve it and submit it, but we couldn't edit it right now, so there might be some. Okay. So, we, so have I, I have, I have, yeah, I mean, if we agree on these changes, okay. I can get the EQS list, and we change subjects and issues to topics that's consistent, and then change concept to understanding. If everyone is, I mean, if everyone, can we do that? Can we say we approve it? We did. I was gonna say we did. We did that previously when there was a top, short timeline. Yeah. And so we just have to adopt it and then approve it again. Mm -hmm. I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's what we did. So we yeah. we adopted it, and we approved it. We affirmed it. 
Uh, there's on. there's questioning looks over in the corner. Oh, question. <laughs> yeah, I, my computer just died. I was curious about what your policy on policy says. If there's anything that would inform that, right? The way that we act now. I think the affirmation would be huge, though, for mm -hmm. our teachers. Yeah, and, and I, mean, I think, think that that if we did that, and that was what our council suggested, we we did because our policy. I don't have it right in front of me, but our policy was vague on on that. So we, the suggestion was that we approved it as as amended, and then we reaffirmed it at our next meeting because then that counts as two readings. Okay. Yeah, as a, as a second reading, we can adopt it as a second reading. Well, we policy. well we're, we're, we're talking about adopting it now. No. Right. Yeah. And then Affirm amending and affirming it again. Just okay. to, I'm wondering if just to strengthen it, yeah. we vote on the amendments, and then we vote to adopt it tonight. Mm -hmm. We can yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, so, Michaela just looked up the list from EQS. I just wanted to read it to you so you know what it says. Um, so it says... Based upon the student's race, gender, color, creed, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, gender identity or disability, or any other reason set forth in state or federal non-discrimination requirements. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, you want to make a motion? Well, I just want, I'm going to I'm just going to read through the edits one more yes. time to make sure everybody. Okay. So in the first paragraph, we were going to change the word subjects to topics. In the second paragraph, we are going to change the word concept to understanding. In the third paragraph, we were going to change issues to topics. And then at the bottom of the first page, we were going to, and I'll read it just one more time, add the list that's in EQS, which says. So would you just read that entire paragraph? So it all flows together. The, the last one? Yes. That's in our policy? Yes. Okay. So, all students deserve an education that helps them understand who they are and where they come from and gives them the confidence and skills to work and learn constructively with others regardless of, I gotta find it again, sorry, of students' race, gender, color, creed, national origin, marital status, sexual orientation, <coughs> gender identity or disability, or any other reason set forth in state or federal non-discrimination requirements. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe there are any changes on the back. Okay. So is that, do we have a motion? Are you prepared yeah. to do a motion on the amendment? Yes. Of the amendment. Okay, go ahead. I move that we accept the amendments to policy D24. Second. Moved by Ursula, second by Daniel. No. Amelia, Amelia, <laughs> Amelia. <laughs> All right. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. So now, could I have a motion to adopt policy D24 as amended? Ursula? Oh, oh sorry, Patrick? Second. Second. Okay, Patrick okay. and McKaylin. <laughs> uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And I'm looking back at Lisa because I see a face yeah. of confusion. Sorry. Who, who um, made the motions? So Ursula made the first one. Who seconded that one? So Amelia. Amelia. And then, okay, and then the, and the next one was Patrick moved and, and Michaela in second. Okay, thanks. And all eyes. All right. Okay, thank you. All right, so awesome. moving there, into person now. No, I don't know. No, no, we have one more um, F F45, we revised. Uh, and Chris, can I interject here? Sure, Stu. Um, so it came to my attention um, just prior to this meeting that this wasn't the final copy because um, we re we had questions about it in the policy committee as whether or not this was the one that we had um, settled on, it was, it was. and it was not. So uh, Suzanne and um, Derek were able to let us know. So I would just ask that we table this and get the right policy here because we don't want to approve yeah, the no wrong policy. Yeah. <laughs> so okay. I, I apologize for that, but I, I think we've identified the right one Good. so that we can bring that to the committee. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we'll write the personnel and approve <coughs> new teachers on page 68. Oh, there's no. The yes. Yeah. So, can I have a motion to accept? Go ahead, Ursula. I move that we accept the resignation of Brian Fisher from Service Director at U32. Second. 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 Second.
second. Ursula and a second by Natasha. Thank you, Brian. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Carrying none, the motion carries. Thank you. Yeah, and now we can go back to our consent agenda, I believe. So, approve the minutes of October 1st. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes? The I motion? had a question. Okay. I had a question. Okay. Was can Chris's you wait for the, can you, a oh. uh, question on the minutes? I'm sorry. Yeah. Question on the minutes? Okay, so hold on yes. a minute. Uh, a motion to approve the minutes? Where's that? I move that we approve the minutes of October 1st, 2024. Could I have a second? A second. Thank you, Natasha. Now, uh, Julia. Not discussion, sorry. Discussion. Yeah, go ahead. I wondered if Chris's town was uh, accurately um, represented. Where are you from, Chris? Middlesex, right? Middlesex, yeah. It says Callus, I think. Where? Oh, I didn't keep track. But I read this earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where is it, uh, Julia? Yeah. You know, I'm not sure right now. I'm, I'm searching for it. I think it's on page 75, halfway down. It says. Oh yeah, I found it too. Sorry. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah. yeah it's time. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so so I would change that. It was talking about Chris's. Did you find it? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. It's minor, but still. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, hey, Daniel. Sure. Um, Craig Lyons' name is misspelled. Where? Um, yeah. At the beginning of the configuration presentation, in particular, um, a member of the public interrupted, et cetera, et cetera. Craig Line, L I N E. That's, his name is L I N E. Yeah. Is that how you actually spell it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that lion. not lion? No. no. Okay. Okay. Yeah, lion. Okay. Yeah, lion. Nice. All right. All those in favor of approving the minutes as amended, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, we did it. Board orders. Board orders. The folder in front of Chris. Chris. Right here. Okay, Chris. Okay. Do the math. Or give it the math right. <laughs> or read. Oh, I thought you can anyway. just read it. Okay. What? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so, move that we approve the board orders in the amount of 750783 dollars and 58 cents and in the amount of three hundred and seventy eight thousand five hundred and fifteen dollars and sixty nine cents and the amount and in the amount of seven thousand four hundred and ninety one dollars and forty nine cents for the total of one million one hundred and forty four thousand seven hundred and ninety dollars and seventy six cents second thank you daniel so Moved by Chris, second by Daniel. <coughs> Any discussion? Hearing none, all of those. Uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. Uh, future agenda items, uh, we, I wanted, I'm not going to pull it out right now because I didn't cut it out, but uh, in our uh, board work, we, uh, Stephen already uh, shared that we are going to be looking at our budget. At the, at, the, at the next meeting, and that's gonna take most of, we'll come back with some configuration uh, recommendations. We have the board resolution discussion, and that's what we have for, for right now. Uh, we are all going to the conference, so we'll have some information to share with you guys. Uh, board reflection. Could I, and then just such a remark, do we wanna, oh, yes. wanna invite Joy, or, or have a discussion at some point, or how would we like to proceed? Yeah, let's add it to our our future, uh, future agenda items, and I'll bring it to the to our superintendent and the steering committee, and just try to uh, figure out where to block it in our work plan. Is that okay? That's perfect. Yeah. Do you have something scheduled with Jody on December eighteenth? 
Yeah, yeah but she comes and shares the budget okay, so for her, but we might just, earlier. that's a good idea. We or might just put it together. Yeah. Thank Lauren, you, Amelia. That's great. Laura, I have a question about, um, since we're in a, a difficult budget year, whether or not we want to schedule two board meetings per month that deal with the budget, as opposed to alternating, seems like we do business and then have a forum somewhere, um, but just have two meetings per month dedicated to the budget. So we just approve our schedule, uh, Chris. You approved mm -hmm. it too, and, and sort of I takes did. into consideration all of that. You okay. did. You did. Okay. And I will try and tie the dots all together, but we yeah, all agreed like on that schedule. That does include two meetings. Okay. And okay. it also includes community meetings. So, uh, okay. and we can go through it if you want. Not right now, but I'm okay. happy to sit with you and go over it. Okay. Thanks. Okay? Yeah. All right. Natasha and then uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth and then that. Um, I have a board of function. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the policy committee and to the Humanity and Justice Coalition mm -hmm. for the work that they did on the ed education philosophy mm -hmm. and this uh, civil discourse policy. There was tons of conversation, all incredibly good conversation. And um, it just makes me really proud to be a part of a district that believes in this and wants to um, institutionalize it through philosophy and through policy and I think it's um, a great affirmation for our, our staff mm -hmm. that we believe in what they're doing in the classrooms um, and that we're willing to support them so and thanks for fast tracking okay. Any other board reflections Elizabeth yes sorry it's not a board reflection it's kind of a question about agenda yeah. um, would we discuss adding the two community members. I know that we were kind of going back and forth about, to, sorry, to the configuration committee. Is that a configuration committee agenda item or a board agenda item? So I thought that we just voted in adding two members to the configuration committee. We agreed right. all, we voted But there was that more, more to it, like what the criteria would be if more than one person applied. Those types of things. Yeah, so that would go to the steering committee, but we also said that Daniel has agreed to work with me on a charge for the configuration committee, which also will help create that criteria. Okay. Great. That, Thank and you. then we will bring it to the board. Okay. Sounds good. All right. <laughs> the configuration committee and then the board. Uh, yeah. Any other board reflections, Daniel? Also, also more related to agenda, future okay. agenda items, which uh, I was wondering. It may be more germane to ed quality and also the post-secondary outcomes presentation coming up, but um, I'm, I'm interested in learning more about early college and sort of, yeah, reflections and experiences from sort of all stakeholders because I think, um, yeah, I just want to learn more at this point, I guess. And so I don't know if there's a... If, if it's appropriate to include that in the presentation, or if I defer to Ursula and Jen about when best to bring that up. But. I think it would fit. I mean, if you agree, I don't wanna. Yeah, there is a, there's a section about early college that will be incorporated in the post-secondary outcomes <laughs> report, and you, if it doesn't meet your needs or answer all your questions, you can let us know and we can fill in. But yes, it is on the docket as part of that. Any other board reflections? Okay, hearing none, uh, I will look for a motion to adjourn. Oh. And thank you. Oh, well, yes, public comment. And I didn't look at you, and Kelly and Julia. Do you have any board reflections? So you're good. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to open it to public comment. Are there any? We don't have any members of the public here, but I'm wondering if there's any members. I see one hand. Uh, okay. Is there more? Okay, Jody, you're raising your hand too. Okay, I'm gonna let Jody go first, and then you can go and Noah. And can you unmute I yourself, can... Jody? And uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, can, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I I don't want to take any more time. Uh, the boosters. There was another booster member here with me tonight, uh, going through the whole board meeting, and then the fundraising policy got tabled. So, um, is there an opportunity for us to? Um, submit questions or concerns about the policy before the next time it gets presented at a board meeting? Yeah. And, and who would we direct those to? 
Paul Isaac and the superintendent. Yeah, directed to uh, the superintendent and uh, Chris McVeigh as the chair of the okay. policy committee. Okay, thank you. Um, Jody, I've got Jody, the floor. Wait, <laughs> make sure she has the right policy because yeah. if, if you're. Yeah. Well, I'll make sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Jody, I'll get you the right policy that we're going to be examining. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Noah. No, Langstein from Worcester. Um, I'll try to be brief. I know it's late. Two um, minutes. <laughs> yep, I got Two it. Um, I'll stick to it. So um, just wanted to say that I was really heartened to hear the, um, the movement towards more community engagement, especially with regards to the configuration committee. Um, and I, I just wanted to echo Keeley's concern about the, the potential politics. And I just wanted to throw my support behind the idea, first off, of separating the configuration committee from the finance committee, because I do agree that it is confusing and it's not just semantics. I mean, it, it really, it matters. Um, and also that if you were to separate it out, then you could actually redo the configuration committee meeting to have five board members, one from each town, and then five community members, one from each town. And as much as we all want to believe that we all represent everybody in practice, you know, it's both. There's a reason that we have three representatives from each town because those people are the ones that are best poised to take the pulse of their own community. And so I think being able to have equitable representation even on the um, configuration committee would be just a, a better practice. And it would also allow for each of those, you know, for, for one board member and one community member to then be able to hold forums within each of their own communities and be able to really have more dialogue. There, there's a lot of limitation with the two minute public comment thing. That real dialogue I think would go a lot further. Um, so those are those are my two cents. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now I'll be looking for a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Leah. Staying. Staying late. Late. Sorry. Okay. A motion to adjourn. Okay. All of those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Bye. Julie. Bye, Julia.